Good morning. It's Thursday, June 25th, 2015. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 189, and it is a beautiful Pacific Northwest today. I love it when I come on here and say it's gorgeous, although I realize I should probably lie. I think I should start lying. Yeah. I think I'll come on here and say, oh, oh, it's so awful and it's so stormy here in the... Don't move here. Don't live here. You don't want to live here. It's awful. I'm just going to come on and tell you that. It's a real bad place to live. Don't move here. So we have a few interesting stories to get to. This is the last Tech Talk today of the week this week because I'm making room for the ladies' tech radio, women's tech radio on Friday. And they come in and they don't do it live, but they record a huge batch. They get a whole bunch of really great guests all lined up. And it is an impressive marathon of recording, but I have to get out of the way. So this will be our last episode this week, but I'll be back on Tuesday. And I wanted to start with something that really, actually, you know what it does, to tell you the truth? Uh, if I was going to be honest with you, this next thing, this our first story this week. You know what really grinds my gears? This story really grinds my gears. So let's bring in our Mumble Room to cover this one. Time of Probes, greetings there, Mumble Room. Hello. Hello. Hey, Hello. guys. So, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because I don't own any of the current generation consoles. Maybe because I've pretty much just declared myself a PC gamer. But this first story really bugs me. Uh, so, Batman Arkham Knight sales have been suspended on the PC platform following the launch disaster that has been Arkham Knight. Uh, in a statement posted on the publisher's forum, uh, WB Games po- apologizes yeah, to PC gamers who are experiencing performance issues with Arkham Knight. The company takes these issues very seriously uh, and therefore have decided to suspend future game sales on the PC version while they work to address the issues to satisfy our quality standards. Huh. Would have been interesting to satisfy those quality standards before you shipped. Uh, So anyways, they go on to say, The launch of Batman Arkham Knight has been nothing short of a disaster! This is a text bot writing this part. With users everywhere reporting major performance issues and all sorts of hardware combinations, including NVIDIA and AMD. And I have seen some bitching on Reddit like you wouldn't believe, personally. Uh, Arkham Knight was allegedly ported to the PC, get ready for this, by a third-party development studio containing just... 12 people. Which might explain why so many people are experiencing issues playing it. Hmm. Yeah, it turns out, written for the consoles first, ported to the PC later. And uh, this is one that's supposed to be coming to Linux later on, and a port of a port. Is this is that what Linux is going to get now? A port of a port? You got the PC, you got the console version ported to the PC, then the PC version ported to the Linux version. It's a major facepalm situation, uh, and I don't understand why it even made it out the door like this. Uh, it, it's like, as you, soon as you just install it on the PCs... They set deadlines and don't care. You think that's what it is? It, just, ah, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. We'll fix it with a patch. I bet that is what it is. They get themselves convinced, like, you know, these kinds of things are just ongoing projects. They're never fixed. They're always a work in progress. That's probably how they justify it to themselves. Uh, so I feel bad for the gamers that bought it. I, uh, I've been waiting to buy it when it comes out for Steam on Linux, and hopefully it'll be in a much, much better shape when that happens. Uh, Arkham Knight sales suspended, though. I can't remember the last time a video game sales were completely suspended like that. Do you guys? It's been a while. Not nice. really. <clears throat> Yeah. I'm not surprised considering all the times that people were shipping games that are massively broken lately. Past yeah. couple years or so, people were complaining for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very true. So, uh, nothing's secure, nothing's safe. This homemade spy gadget can steal ra- stray radio waves emitted by a laptop CPU. <laughs> Researchers at Tel Aviv University in Israel, uh, as research lab, have uh, de- developed a device capable of wirelessly stealing data from nearby notebooks. The palm-sized gadget doesn't hijack Wi-Fi or Bluetooth signals. No, that's... <laughs> no, come on, that's old. Instead, it captures the stray radio waves emitted by a system's processor. The, st- the spy device, which costs about $300 to build, uses readily available components, can work 19 inches away. How about that? How about that? And here we have a picture of it right here. This neat little this neat little gadget uh, also can back as it can also work as a wi- Wi-Fi eavesdropper. Uh, this technology might sound cutting edge, but scientists have known for decades that computers leak sensitive information from in the form of radio waves. Back in 1985, Dutch security researchers were able to pick up radio waves from a CRT monitor and use the data to reconstruct the on-screen images. Wow! Wow! How about that? That is something else. For about $300, you could... I wonder how much data they could actually reconstruct. That is... And they have a little demo of it here on TechSpot if you guys want to find that. Link in the show notes. Yeah, Kits and Kitty points out that E.T. for Atari in the 1980s had some of its copies destroyed because it was sucked so bad. That was what came to mind, but I'm sure there's been something more dramatic since then. Well, I don't know about more dramatic, but I'm sure there has been a situation since then where uh, games had to do that. Uh, but yeah, that E.T. one is a fascinating story if you guys are not familiar with the E.T. Uh, Atari buried them in a landfill because they, they had so many extra copies, they, they were embarrassed, they didn't know what to do with them. 
Desktop users, congratulations for those of you using Cinnamon. Cinnamon 2.6 has been released. Uh, lots of new features. <coughs> Excuse me. You no longer need to recompile Cinnamon to choose between console kit and login D supports. That's very nice. Going to make it much easier to move between distros. Multi-monitor support has had some really nice improvements, including better window list actions and new key bindings that allow you to move windows to other monitors, like Super Shift and then the arrow keys to pop the window over. Very cool. Panel and applet improvements, as always. Panels can now be added, removed, and configured individually and moved to different positions across the multiple monitors. Nice. Applets. A new inhibit applet has been introduced to allow you to quickly turn off notifications or disable power management for a little while. I don't need it all the time! Like, you know, this is something I use constantly. I, on the Linux desktop, I use a program called Caffeine. You might want to check it out. It's also a GNOME extension. And uh, Caffeine is, you just, t you, you, you tap that button on Caffeine, and it just prevents your screensaver and your power, your monitor from sleeping as long as Caffeine's enabled. And then uh, when you unclick it, your regular power management and screensaver stuff resumes. The other, then I use it in combination with that, <clears throat> and I don't think I have it on my Bonobo here, so I can't show you. I don't. The other thing I use in combination with that is I have a GNOME extension that uh, allows me to immediately turn off my monitor. So if, I'm, if I know I'm done and I don't need to wait the 35, 45 minutes for the power setting to, to kick in, under my, gear, under my main config menu, I have a turn off monitor. And I click that and my monitor immediately goes off. Uh, and so uh, the, the new inhibit applet is sort of similar to that. And also it also will control uh, no, the notification system, which I think is really nice. So if you don't want your screen dimming for a little bit, you don't have to go modify your power settings. You can just do that. So we might have a review coming up very soon on a future show. It looks like a pretty good desktop. Anybody in the uh, mumble room using Cinnamon by chance or interested in the new Cinnamon 2.6 release? I'm interested in playing with it, but I doubt I'd move to it. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of where I'm at too, you know? I'll give it a look. Try it out. I, I'm probably not going to switch to it anytime soon. Uh, there's nothing quite there for me anymore, although although I, I'll, I'll reserve judgment because you know what? Cinnamon, if you, if you, if you like GNOME, and you like KDE, and you, you you just but so for some reason neither one of them are scratching an itch for you. You want something in between. Cinnamon is a lot like it's a it's a GTK desktop with a few extra knobs than most GTK desktops usually have, which is kind of it sort of walks like it's almost like a, a GTK KDE that is less complicated. Yeah, I give them credit. The panel applets are actually pretty cool. Yeah, especially the configurable menu is that's amazing applet. That is really cool. You I'll tell you, like anything you want it to be. I, I respect that they just keep pushing away at it and keep making it better and better. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely going to have to give it a look. I'll tell you about something that is compelling that I want to switch to right away. And you will too. This 9-volt battery makes your smoke detector so much less annoying. I don't know what it is. Uh, you know, oh my gosh. Now, I, um, here, I'll give you a little background. You see, as a podcaster, whenever you have somebody in the mumble room or one of your remote hosts or a guest that has a smoke detector beeping... It sounds like this in the background. Like it's just annoying, like this little background noise while they're talking. And it goes off about what, every minute or so? Like it's different smoke detectors apparently have different rates. And, and it's one of these things that apparently sometimes people accidentally just start living with. Just by accident. <laughs> and they just beeps. I got a neighbor. <laughs> Excuse me. I have a neighbor. It's unbelievable. Their smoke detector in their house has been beeping for a month. I can hear it from my driveway. If I can hear their smoke detector from my driveway, it must be so loud in their house. And they still don't change it. And you know what happens to, to, to Angela and I all the time is it's a smoke detector in one of the children's rooms at 3 a.m. that goes out. And it's you would think, oh, man, that's only going to happen a few times. Every single time! Every time, every time, every time, 3 a.m., one of the children's room, it's a smoke detector. Every time. I'm getting the ladder out from the garage. I'm carrying that big-ass ladder all the way upstairs because it's a vaulted ceiling. I'm, br I'm busting out this huge ladder at 3 freaking a.m. All the kids are awake. The wife is awake. I'm awake. And I've done this three or four times now. So, <laughs> this is where our next invention comes in. This 9-volt battery is a Wi-Fi powered freaking battery. Yeah, that's right, a Wi-Fi freaking powered battery. So it's not the smoke detector that gets smart, but the battery. The Roost is a $35 9-volt Wi-Fi battery in your smoke alarm. It notifies you via your smartphone when your smoke detector is about to go off or is going off. It will let you know if your smoke detector uh, is running low on batteries and send you a push notification. Uh, the Roost battery has Wi-Fi, radio, and microphones as well. The microphone picks up the sound of your smoke detector's 
alarm and transmits the alert via your phone. So there's no wiring that needs to be done. You just put this little battery in your frequent smoke detector. You can get two for 65 bones. They're available on pre-order for Amazon right now and start shipping in freaking September. I'm buying one. I'm probably going to have to buy two because you can get them for a set. And I'm putting those in the kids' smoke detectors because they, oh, as you can tell, as you can tell, it has been a stress point for me. <laughs> I just can't even, I just, oh, man. And then what's so crazy, what's so crazy is, <clears throat> is to know that there's people out there that just live with this super high-pitched chirp. And it's drilling into your head. Stop it. Especially fix it before you come on the mumble room. I'm just saying. Uh, so there you go. The Roost 900. How about that for a battery? The Roost 900. A smart battery for smoke alarms. I wonder what else you could use this thing for. Anyways, two pack on Amazon right now, $64. One, one battery, $34.99. Not yet out, though. September. No more 3 a.m. chirps. That's literally... I, look at that. They know. I wonder... You know what I suspect about 3 a.m. too? Because this has happened enough that I've now had to pontificate on why the hell are my smoke alarms going off at 3 a.m. in my children's room? What is it that's causing this? Is there something I could do differently to prevent this from happening because it appears to be a trend, right? This is what my mind starts going towards when this starts happening all the time. And I have it. I think my house's temperature begins to shift dramatically around 3 a.m. and begins dropping in temperature and I think as it gets cold, the batteries start to go, and it starts beeping. I think it is actually more likely to happen at 3 a.m. because of the temperature shift that happens in my house at 3 a.m. That's my theory. And so that's why I think it's always going to happen at 3 a.m. Because it has so far, in the seven years I've been living there. I think it's just like a, a global massive trolling by the manufacturers. <laughs> right? And, oh, man. Why can't they, like... I don't know. I feel like they gotta have a better system for this. Maybe you know. Speaking of better systems, uh, how about holographic displays? Right now, we've been talking 4K. We've been talking 3D. Uh, sure, that's cool. That's quaint. But what about holographic? Well, guess what? That is our Kickstarter of the week this week with 392 backers. They've already raised 208,000 U.S. bones uh, when they were going for 40,000. With 14 days left to go, it's Hollows, the interactive tabletop graphic. I'm sorry, holographic display. How about that? Imagine, Imagine a world, guys. A world where dreams meet reality. Where digital meets physical. Humans need connection. We spend huge amounts of our day interacting with others around us. But often, when we look around us, we find the current technology is individual-focused. We miss out on real-life moments. Here at H+, we want to change that. Hollis is a tabletop holographic display that enhances your life and invites connection. It is a central place to sync any type of device and to display its content from all sides. You can play games with family, connect across generations, work together cooperatively, or compete head to head. Make education an engaging experience. For something so natural as sharing and displaying, we wanted to make something with as many viewing angles as possible. To get to where we are today, we iterated hundreds of times. We settled on a design that's beautiful, strong, and safe. It has an eco-friendly monitor, and its tempered glass has a coating that is specially designed to reflect a specific amount of light for optimal display quality. USB and HDMI ports allow devices to connect and display on the hulls. From gesture-based controls like leap motion to brain sensors and a 3D printer, we have tested them all with the Hollis and are adding more connection options to make the Hollis more natural and intuitive to interact with. Hmm. Making the Hollis combine with lots of different software and hardware makes it even more complex. That's why we have assembled the best team possible to do just that and are encouraging more great programmers to develop content for the Hollis once it is released. We have Unreal and Unity SDKs available and are adding more wow, Unreal SDK in the future. <clears throat> Connection is important to everyone. You've gone as far as we can go without more support and need your help to take us to the next level. We are so excited to bring the Hollis to life and get it into your hands. I want to play baseball in our space! 
I want to see fireworks from Mars. But can we come back? Of course. Yeah, it'd be pretty neat. Hollow world. So Hollows, uh, H-P-L-U-S tech.com if you want to see more, or we'll have a link to the Kickstarter in the show notes. And uh, it's that. Yeah, like the chat room said, it's Back to the Future come to life. Uh, it is not a huge display. It is a triangular uh, glass display in a larger box. But um, it's a three-dimensional holographic display that has HDMI and display ports. And you saw, too, that they talked about integrating different types of uh, control, like the uh, Leap uh, Motion, which is the uh, um, um, radar-based uh, sensing that we've talked about on previous shows. Pretty, pretty, pretty neat stuff. And uh, it really does kind of feel like the future. It's, it, it feels also very limited, but yet a step in the right direction. Um, now, I don't know, though. Uh, it, it could also be one of these things that never really gets a lot of traction. It could be 2015's Virtual Boy. Uh, what do you guys think, Mumble Room? You're the jury on this. Is this a backing-worthy project, or is this something to pass on? Anybody want to take a crack? I would like to play with it, and maybe it would be like a great thing for like uh, science centers and stuff like that for, to get kids excited for different things. So it could be cool for that situation, but for the home, that uh, – no. I don't know. I don't think anybody would really need that. So they had early birds, six fifty, six hundred fifty dollars. You get your very own Hollows Pro, and then when you step it up, you get like uh, the Leap Bundle at seven hundred fifty dollars. You get the Hollows Pro and the Leap Motion Sensor to interact with it. Hmm, that's kind of neat. I don't know. That's not bad. I don't know. Sean, would you uh, buy one of these for your house if say it was two hundred, three hundred dollars? I might, uh, although I don't know about the Leap Motion. Hmm. Mm. What do you think, Kitson? I think two hundred dollars. I would bite on it. Um, I see that it would probably be very good for video games or and such. And uh, two hundred is about the starting point of an average like Wii U or. Uh, mm-hmm. I could also see it being around a thousand dollars, to be honest with you, and then it becoming more like a, a showroom piece. Uh, like maybe the Tesla dealership would have one of these in their showroom, and uh, you know, a jewelry store, and, and things like that could have these high-end display pieces to show you uh, something that is a limited quantity that they maybe don't even have in the store, but they want to be able to give you a lot of different viewing angles of it, and maybe see what it really have a, a more actual lifelike size version of it, something like that. I could see it working in that capacity as well, not just for for home stuff. Uh, I don't know. Maybe somebody could even make some original content for it. I, it's neat that they have a uh, they have a SDK for both uh, Unreal and um, Unity. So they, they at least they're on the right, and they have a working prototype that they've been showing off at conventions as well. So it's not a total uh, fabrication. They have a real working unit. So that's also a good sign. So I think it's backworthy if if you want, but <clears throat> unfortunately. To get in on anything that gets hardware, you basically are gonna have to get it at six five hundred and sixty dollars, uh, and there's only thirty four spots in that one left. And then otherwise, it's kind of just like ten dollars is the starting price, twenty five, thirty five dollars. You get like a shirt and stuff, but you don't get any hardware until you get up to six hundred dollars. Be really neat to see this come to market. I'll keep an eye out for it and see what happens. And if you want to back it, you can find the link in the show notes. And that brings us to the end of today's Tech Talk today, which is the end of the week's run of Tech Talk. So I can get out of the way for Women's Tech Radio tomorrow. But I'll be back on Tuesday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. And if you catch anything while we're off the air, please drop it in our subreddit, techtalktoday.reddit.com. Yeah, techtalktoday.reddit.com. That makes this show better. And also, you can give us your feedback. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. And I'd love to have you join us live and then hang out in the mumble room. To get into your local time, just go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Now, this end of show clip comes from Japan, and it's a little weird. Uh, it's going to be a audio experience if you're just listening, and if you're watching, well, it's going to be a visual treat, I hope. It's a little weird. Uh, it's Nintendo, so what do you expect? But I thought I'd leave you with something on the strange side for today's end of show clip. See you right back here on Tuesday, everybody. Hope to see you over the weekend for the Linux Action Show, and I believe the Faux Show is back as well. See you on Tuesday for this show. Bye, everybody. Ah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>